You're listening to a podcast for sinners and sufferers, having conversations about theology, faith, and culture for weary souls in need of grace. My name is Cody. And my name is Kyle. Cody, Mm -hmm. this week, you've seen uh, Book of Boba Fett, right? Of course. The new episode? Yeah. Good. Good. So I wanted to talk about this because, well, anyone who watches the video on YouTube will notice my background. Star Wars. Yeah. The Star Wars poster. So um, that would seem to communicate that I am quite a Star Wars fan. Um, beyond just a Star Wars fan, I'm a, also can get quite nerdy about the behind the scenes stuff as far as it gets into making movies and shows and VFX, all that kind of thing. Mm. And this week in the book of Boba Fett, uh, we had something very interesting happen where they deep faked young Mark Hamill onto Luke Skywalker. And he was basically one of the main characters of the episode. Mm. Um, for those who don't know what a deep fake is basically it's, um, so Mark Hamill is obviously not how old he was in the seventies anymore. So he looks much older. Um, so they have put a body double in the show and then digitally put Mark Hamill's young face onto this actor. So it looks mm-hmm. like, or it's at least supposed to look like Luke Skywalker from that time period. Right. Yeah. So, um, this happened at the finale of the Mandalorian season two mm-hmm. and there was tons of complaints about it. People were like upset Not, well, not upset. They were just like, oh, that looks fake. Like, we can tell it's not him. The face doesn't move as he talks or anything. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But when I I saw that, I was like, that's crazy. Because it looks like, to me, it's like, that's impressive that they can even do that. Mm -hmm. But obviously, people have to complain. You know, we can't just enjoy the fact that there's this cool cameo at the end of it. Yeah. I get it. This episode of Book of Boba Fett was my like mouth was wide open the whole time because they basically they they've improved it quite a bit. It, like, I don't know what you thought of it, but it looks a lot more yeah. like him for sure. And like a real person. Um, but they were basically like, OK, you all complained about that small cameo at the end of the finale. Why don't we do a whole episode where it's him and they just showed him off the, the, the technology of the whole episode. Yeah. It was crazy. Yeah. What did you, what did you think about it? I think it looked surprisingly good though. I got a little bit, it seemed a little uncanny to me and maybe it's because I know that I know it's fake that I'm like hyper analyzing it. And I think like just in the moment I'd have to go watch it again, but I think it was because his skin is too perfect. I think he almost looks like he's been airbrushed in real life. And that's what's mm-hmm. a little uncanny about it. It was, I mean, it was cool seeing like Skywalker. I have mixed feelings because they've been shoving so many characters into this. Like they brought back Mando. They had that blue guy from Clone Wars. I never watched Clone Wars, so I don't, I don't remember what his name is. Um, and I'm like, this is begum- becoming like the how many toys can we sell episode. <laughs> It's true, but the the irony of the whole thing is it's called the Book of Boba Fett, and the best <laughs> two episodes in the season are where he's not in it. Like this last episode, he was literally in it for I think five seconds yeah. of screen time, literally, where he's just standing there listening. Mm. I, I and the episode so, before, he wasn't in it at all. I feel so bad because the actor's great. Like I like him. Yeah. I like the character of Boba Fett. And I feel like they're trying to do this like Western gangster movie hybrid. And when they have Western moments, like they do a train heist, that was so fun. What a great moment. But then a lot mm-hmm. of it's them just walking around and sitting around and it's like uh, the Godfather or whatever. But I mean, the God, like, I don't know if you've watched the Godfather or the the sequel Godfather 2. Is there three of them? I feel like there's, there's three. three. Okay. I definitely just slept through the third one and I have no idea what happened. No one cares about it. All the, like... 
there's some action, but for the most part, all they do is sit around and talk. And I feel like Boba Fett, Book of Boba Fett's been giving me some like Godfather vibes where they're like, look at these gangsters sitting around and talking. I'm like, shoot something. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> get into a fight. <laughs> Rob a train again. That was fun. <laughs> I know. Well, maybe we'll have to do our review of season one of it when when the finale comes out after this yeah. week. But we should um, be. Well, low key, we'll start another podcast. It'll be one of those like the Christian perspective on this TV show, <laughs> or we'll just just the gospel Star Wars. and the Book of Boba Fett. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah. I, so I sent you uh, some links. Something that I thought was really mm-hmm. funny is I got an email this week from CSB, Christian Standard Bible, which I will say, decent translation. I mean, I'm an ESV guy. I love the ESV, but CSB, decent translation. No shade on on that. But the email is like, just in time for Valentine's Day. So I'm thinking it's a Bible study on relationships or something like that, right? I open it and it's like, one for him, one for her. And it's Bibles. They're like his and her (laughs) Bibles. And I'm like, what? How is that? And like, this is so crazy. So the biggest difference I think is inside of it. Like they have these key verses where they pull out a verse that they think is important, which is kind of odd to me because it's the Bible. Um, and in the women's, it's like these curvy lines and flowers. And in the men's, it's like geometric shapes. And it's like, yeah, this Bible verse. But what really... Yeah. <laughs> What really okay, cracked sorry, me up. Before you go before okay. you go on with that. The funniest part about that is the women's one is like you said, like flowery, like this one is like glory, majesty, power, and authority. And there's like flowers behind it. And this is it's in this like mm-hmm. cursive writing. And then you go to the guys page and it's like features. And it's like a literal diagram of the tabernacle with information, <laughs> spiritual <Yeah>. gift. <laughs> graph with like all this like information on it and it's like for girls we just want to give them these like flowery pictures but for guys they get the real information yeah like what what is that okay so that's crazy i have so many like totally offside jokes i could make about how they may have changed the content but what really made me what really cracked me up um was that the men's bible comes in forest green brown black charcoal some classic i mean the green's a little exciting classic bible colors meanwhile the women's version comes in brown navy poppy two types of gray rose gold champagne emerald black and sand <laughs> like <laughs> grief um it's just it blows my mind because can you imagine doing this with any other book if they're like Wow, just in time for Valentine's Day. It's, you know, uh, J.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit. It's, uh, you know, Eye of the World, Robert Jordan, Wheel of Time, book one. His and hers version. <laughs> it's like, it's it's a book. You read it. <laughs> like, who cares what co- color it is? The female Lord of the Rings book would have a, a, a colorful insert of flowers and, and poppies and rainbows that says <laughs> fly you fools on it. Yes. Like. <laughs> oh, I kind of want to, I think we should publish our own Bible. I want to do like a Bible for metalheads where it only comes in black and then the paper is black and the text is white and it like the featured yeah. verses are ones about death and destruction throughout. But I just, yeah. I think it's crazy that we have to market truth, but also just market this in general. That's like, it's a book that we believe was given to us by the creator of everything, the ultimate authority, the God of heaven and earth. He's like, here are laws. Here's a story of how, you know, humanity fell out of favor with me and how I, I've taken these great steps to reconcile humanity. And it's like, it's a fascinating, it's an amazing book. And we're like, uh, I don't know. It's like, but it comes in champagne. It's like, oh, yeah. I'm going to read it now. <laughs> Now I'm interested in it. Yeah, it, it, this is so funny to me. It is. It is quite funny how like it because it, it's now like publishers making the book, so they have to market it in some way, and this is mm-hmm. how they decide to do it. So, 
Um, guys cannot like wonderful pictures of verses in their Bibles, but girls yeah. definitely can. And girls hate information. It's true. So we won't put that in there. <laughs> uh, man. Well, today uh, we don't have any flowery pictures for you or anything. I haven't even got a colorful shirt on for you to make you want to listen to this. However, <laughs> we are talking some straight information <laughs> here on uh, continuing on talking about our sinful state. If you heard our last episode, we got into the fall on how sin came into our world and we, we now we're experiencing the results of a sinful, broken world. And we talked about how Christians, we understand that ultimately the problem in the world, the problem with creation, that all these other issues like injustice and inequality and poverty and sickness, all these things stem from this problem of sin in a fallen world and that our hope is reconciliation through Christ with God. Um, and now we want to explore more of the, the implications of the introduction of sin into the world and specifically the implications of sin's corrupting effect on people, on us, right down to our very natures. And we're doing this, we're continuing just through chapter six of the, our, our all-time favorite statement of faith, the 1689 London Baptist Confession. Kyle, you want to read that paragraph two? Yeah, yeah. We're not Westminster Confession guys. We're the London Baptist guys. So <laughs> here we go. <laughs> Chapter six, paragraph two. Our first parents, by this sin, fell from their original righteousness and communion with God. And we in them, whereby death came upon all, all becoming dead in sin and wholly defiled uh, in all the faculties and parts of soul and body. So, Two concepts today uh, that we're going to be hitting up is uh, original sin and depravity. So last week we talked about um, how sin entered into the world um, through uh, the fall in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Um, so we want to talk a little bit about original sin first. Um, what is this all about? What is this talking about, Cody, in the topic of original sin? Yeah. Well, so the confession, it, I mean, it puts it a little bit old timey, but essentially what it's saying is our first parents. So this is affirming effectively a, a literal Adam and Eve. It's saying that they, our first parents fell from righteousness and communion with God, which we talked about last week, and that we have fallen with them. As a, as a result of, of their fall, we now experience the effects of a corrupt world. We get sick, we suffer, our bodies are, are dying. But beyond these external effects, we are also personally guilty of Adam's sin. His, his guilt has been imputed to us. We often use that word when we talk about, you know, Jesus' righteousness being imputed to us. We're credited. We're considered to have his righteousness. Well, because of the fall, our initial state is that we're being imputed the guilt of, of Adam's sin. Yeah, it's, um, it's something that, um, you would call this biblical theology. So two terms for you, biblical theology is one, and that's basically taking into account all the, what the Bible says about a topic. So when it comes to this, you read Genesis one, two, and three, you obviously see sin entering into the world. Mm -hmm. Um, Romans five verse 12 and other parts, which we'll mention a few, um, says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all, all sinned. So what that's telling us now is looking back at Genesis 1, 2, and 3, when Adam sinned and sin entered into the world, um, it's repeating that and saying, so death, because of that, death spread to all men because all have sinned. So it relates that guiltiness and sin to us as well. Mm. Um, the second one, the second term that would be important is this term of federal headship. So um, we believe in a doctrine because we believe scripture says it of federal headship where effectively in the garden, 
we sinned with Adam. And so Adam was our representative of uh, humanity. Um, and by nature of being his physical descendants, we also are under his headship. So when, when he sinned, um, he was a representative for humanity in that. And mm-hmm. so he's a literal person, but he also is our representative. And so in Adam, uh, we are born in the line of Adam, as, you know, in Adam in sin because of him and because he was our representative. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's sort of the the physical aspect of being physically descendant. It's like we're corrupted and this corruption is being passed down genetically in a way. But then there's also this idea, yeah, federal headship that he was... Um, meant to be the representative, the covenant we talked about last, uh, last episode, the, f- the first covenant made with man, the covenant was made with him and his descendants are, were now responsible for his keeping or breaking it. And, uh, the result is, you know, the Psalmist Psalm 51, uh, five says, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me is, is now we, right from the start, we're entering this world in this line of sin. That is our, our like family history. That is our, our, our origin, our heritage now because of this original sin is sin and iniquity. And it, it's really cool. Cause this is a, an aspect that we struggle with. I think sometimes at least on this side of it, but we do kind of affirm the flip side so like, we'll, we'll say, well, it's not, it doesn't make sense to me that, um, I'm born of sin or sometimes we might think like, oh, it's, it, how is that fair? But we, we do embrace the positive side of it because Jesus often speaks of being born again. This is language we're probably familiar with. If we've been in the church, we've grown up in the church, especially, um, he talks about dying to yourself and being born again. And the apostles talk a lot about, you know, being buried with Christ, dying with him, and then being raised to new life, being a a new creation. You're born. So we were born under Adam's federal headship. We were born in sin, having inherited his guilt. But by dying to ourselves, we can be reborn in Jesus, be born under his federal headship, instead inheriting his righteousness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, 1 Corinthians talks about this. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 uh, says, For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. So Mm. it relates this to things. You you know, you have death and sin in Adam, but when you're born again in Christ, you have life and righteousness. Um, And that's what we're all called to do when we, when we die to ourselves and we're born again by the spirit, um, we now come under that federal headship of Christ. He is our representative now Mm -hmm. before God. Um, it's this idea of transformation, like it's a complete transformation in your life. Um, Second Corinthians five seventeen says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Uh, the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So you are no mm-hmm. longer under Adam. Your representative is now Christ and what he's done uh, on the cross to, to forgive you of sins. Um, and we gain his righteousness through yeah. that. No longer Adam's sin. A whole new identity. The, uh, 1689, the next paragraph, it continues. It says, they being the root and by God's appointment, standing in the room instead of all mankind, the guilt of the sin was imputed and corrupted nature conveyed to all their posterity. That's just descendants. They're descending from them by ordinary generation being now conceived in sin and by nature, children of wrath, the servants of sin, the subjects of death and all other miseries, spiritual, temporal and eternal unless the Lord Jesus set them free. So it's sort of restating um, Adam and Eve. It's saying clearly God appointed them to be the the like head, the representative of all mankind. There's a few different, you know, theological theories about, you know, was this a, a testing period? Was there a period of time where they, if they passed, then all mankind? And I, I don't know that it's entirely important. What's important is that they were, our representatives 
And as their descendants, we now have inherited their corruption unless we are set free by Jesus, unless we, are, we die to these selves and we're born anew in him. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah, it speaks of this, um, this term by nature, children of wrath, um, mm-hmm. which is straight out of <clears throat> Ephesians chapter two, um, which says we were by nature, children of wrath. Um, and it's speaking to this, um, other doctrine, total depravity. Um, I believe pretty much all Christians believe in the depravity of man. Um, we like you and me personally believe in the doctrine of total mm-hmm. depravity meaning that it, it has affected our whole being. Um, this shouldn't be confused with the idea of, you know, in total depravity, we believe that we don't have the ability to please God um, and we have no ability to honor him. We have, it's total inability in a sense, right? This doesn't mean that we can't ever do something that's good um, or something that's moral. So when uh, a judge who is not a believer uh, judges justly and puts someone who's murdered uh, someone else in jail. That is a good moral judgment that they've made. Um, and that is pleasing, right? So mm-hmm. it doesn't mean that we can never make good moral decisions or that we are incapable of morality. Um, but it's what it's saying is that we don't have that ability to please God. Romans 8. Eight, verse 7, uh, for the mindset on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. So that's what it's speaking of. It's mm. in that term nat- by nature, children of wrath, right? Um, but that's what it's getting at there. Yeah, I think that's uh, kind of a, a, a stumbling block for a lot of people. And it's something that's worth addressing because especially in our kind of our culture and our cultural moment, we want to believe that everyone is generally good and it often will appeal to, we see people do, you know, good things. We see people do fair things. We see people be selfless, but we've spoken before about how we were created as moral beings. We were created to be a reflection of God in that way, to be moral, to have a sense of, uh, of, you know, what is right to carry those things out. So we have those glimmers of that. We have some of that residual, but, um, there's this idea, um, I believe it's John Owen calls it splendid vices. This idea that even the good things are corrupted or, uh, Isaiah 40, six, he says, even my righteous deeds are like dirty rags. It's not that there's no good in us. We can't do good, but there are really no good people. We've all been corrupted in some way by this. And I think this comes up when we talk a lot about the gospel and the need for Christ. Like people think, well, I don't need forgiveness because I'm a good person. Or they might think like, why should I be punished? Um, when I'm a good person, just because I don't believe the right thing. And, and the reality is we're all by nature, corrupt children of wrath, um, you know, <laughs> slaves to our, our, our flesh. Um, where is this Matthew 15? I think you didn't mention that, right? As Jesus himself says for mm-hmm. out of the heart, come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual morality, theft, false witness, slander. Um, like, out of though we can do good things, our nature is constantly pulling us back towards sin, constantly pulling us away from wh- how we're created to be. Um, I read this John Owen quote just the other day, so I want to throw this in here. He says, All of our internal faculties were invaded by twisted lusts and everything that might render us unlike God, whose image we have lost. He's saying, like, We were made to be a reflection of him, righteous, moral, perfect. And that's been tainted now. Like our whole purpose has been corrupted by sin because we're no longer acting in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love what it says at the end there, whose image we had lost, because that points us to that whole story in the Bible of basically what we're trying to do is come back and find that image again, right? So Mm -hmm. all these, anytime someone does something good or moral or just according to God's word, um, it's a glimmer of that image of God's in them, right? And so the whole story of the Bible is Genesis 3, man falls into sin and rejects God um, and uh, sins against him. And so this whole story, the whole rest of the Bible story 
is bringing us along to show us trying to get back to that perfect image of God where we have that union with him again, where we're walking in step with him, where we're obeying him and enjoying him. Um, just like at the very beginning in the garden, the way things were intended to be when he made us in his image. And so the image is lost and it's marred by sin. But in Christ, when he saves us, he renews us and he transforms us so that we can you know, display the image of God to, to the world again. And uh, we get this term, which is kind of the final thing we want to talk about is justified yet sinful, because we know that in Christ, when um, he saves us, we are declared righteous. We're justified. Um, mm-hmm. Yet we still deal with the sin in our lives. Yeah. The, the final paragraph of this chapter on the fall and the, and the effects of it uh, says the corruption of nature during this life does remain in those that are regenerated. And although it be through Christ pardoned and mortified yet both itself and the first motions thereof are truly and properly sin. Though we are saints, we are justified. We are still sinners, you know, um, first, first John. And if you haven't read first John in a while, I recommend it because it hits hard, but he, John writes, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And there, it, the truth is not in us. He's saying, if you think you're without sin, you're a liar. Um, you know, Paul talks about in Romans seven, his own struggle is like the thing I don't do the things I want to do. And the things I, I do, I hate is this is a, a constant reality. Like we're not totally depraved. There's some freedom from that when you're justified, when you're being sanctified, but we're still going to ha- struggle with this reality of sin, with this reality of corruption in our natures until that time that we're fully reunited, restored to our position of perfect communion with God, we, we, we call glorification when we're glorified in the final day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what, I mean, that's what Paul points out at the end of Romans 7 too, right? He talks about this constant struggle that he still has with sin, but then he says, verse 24 and 25, what a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Um, The gospel and God's word has shown him his sin and how wretched and sinful we are and our struggle with sin constantly, even in Christ. And yet he says, who can save me? Jesus Christ. And thanks be to God for that. And he praises him for it. Um, Mm. And that's this whole idea of justified, um, uh, justified yet sinful, right? we still struggle with this sin here on this earth in our corrupt nature, but in Christ we have forgiveness. Um, When we do sin, we can go to him and seek that forgiveness. Mm. Um, And that is the, that's really the, the hope that we do have. I I think this is a really important doctrine for our lives for, for two reasons, which are really two sides of the the same coin. And one is that it keeps us from becoming prideful from thinking, uh, I was a sinner like you, but now that I'm justified, I'm so holy and I'm so perfect and I'm higher and above because our human natures, we just always want to find some way to trade in us and them to separate ourselves and think better of ourselves. But reality is we're still struggling. Like there really, there aren't good guys and bad guys. We're all sinners. We're all corrupt. We're all in need of grace. The only good guy is Jesus and he's the one who's saving us. And then on the the other side of that coin is that understanding this doctrine should keep us from despairing, from becoming discouraged and depressed when we do still struggle with sin because we're going to, and that doesn't mean you're not saved. That doesn't mean Jesus has kicked you out of the, of the family. Like we're going to constantly like Paul said it, Paul who wrote like most of the new Testament is saying, I struggle with doing things that I disdain. Like we're going to continue to struggle until that time of glorification. It's a reality and like be, be humbled, but don't be discouraged be confident, not in yourself and your performance, but in the fact that you are forgiven, that Christ stands as mediator and that you, you, if he's died for you, like if you've accepted, you're following him, you're declaring him as Lord, that you will make it, you will be glorified in that final day. Yeah. 
Well, yeah, and that's, I mean, part of our, <clears throat> even part of our name as a podcast, Sinners and Sufferers, is us acknowledging the fact that we do struggle with this sin. And anyone who comes to Christ is not perfect. Um, and Christians are, are not exempt from, from sin and temptation, but we're covered by Christ and we're in him and we find our forgiveness in that. Um, and that's why, you know, we want to end this with, we, we don't want to end up in defeatism or legalism. Defeatism being, um, where you're not even trying to live a holy life. Um, first John has a lot to say about that as well. Um, but basically this idea of saying, you know, I still struggle with this sin. You're in that Romans seven kind of thought where it's like, I'm doing the things I don't want to do. And the things I want to do, I, I'm not doing them. And so it's like, why even bother? Why even try? And basically give up on, on trying to live a holy life. And that's not what we're, what we're supposed to do. Uh, being justified and, and showing our thankfulness to, to God is a life that lives in light of that and, and seeks to honor him with our lives. So we don't want to just give up on living a holy life, but we also don't want to fall into, fall into legalism, um, which is trying to force ourselves into this mold of, of rules that we've made up basically that we've said are, are holy and good. And what that ends up doing is heaping guilt and shame on ourselves and on others. Um, the, a lot of times this is found in um, rules that we make up, in church for, you know, what, what you can wear, how you should look, uh, what, we, what music we should play, all this kind of stuff that we've, we've made up and said, this is how you show that you're holy. Um, that's legalism. We don't want to fall into that either. Um, we should be pursuing God and be being sanctified by his spirit. And that's, that's the goal. Hmm. Yeah. I think that's definitely, that's a balance that will, will constantly, um, be coming back to throughout our entire Christian lives is this back and forth of like, I'm, I'm tr working way too hard to like be legalistic and I'm losing focus of the gospel. I'm losing focus of who God is, who Jesus is. And I'm just focusing on rules. And then we'll, we'll start to go the other way and we'll be like, I just live by grace and I embrace grace, but also like, I guess I can go do this thing I want because it, and we need to be convicted back towards, you know, God does desire for us to be holy, does desire for us to be an, an image of him. And that's something that constantly, and I see that different times in my lives, in my lives, in my life where I'm, I'm constantly back and forth where I'm like, I'm so focused on, you know, these really like understanding the law and these things. And there's times where I'm like, yeah, I'm free <laughs> and I, I need to like be challenged and held accountable. And that's where community is incredibly helpful as well. But mm -hmm. yeah, we easily take advantage of grace and we easily try to fall into this legalism because we think that's the way that we can, we can be justified before God when the reality is in Christ, we already are. And mm -hmm. that's what it, what it all comes down to. Well, we appreciate you listening. If you made it all the way to the end, you're our extra favorite. Um, <laughs> you didn't drop. I would out. send out gold stars if I could. It's true. I mean, I know the statistics are like most people are going to hear us say Boba Fett and be like, nope. So we appreciate you listening. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'd, we'd love for you to join in the conversation. We, uh, you can message us on Instagram or comment on YouTube. And we, we usually reply, especially if you're nice and you're, you're actually asking questions and furthering conversation. We have a Discord. There is a link on the bottom of our website, Sinners and Sufferers. Dot com says join the discord if that is broken for some reason send me a message on instagram because i do need to update it sometimes it, it, it like apparently expires um but we we get some good conversations it's very relaxed oh, cool. so you don't need to be afraid to say anything in the discord um those of us who aren't like already friends are treating each other like even the new people like we're just part of the group and it's great a place to hang out have fun talk about all things maybe we'll start a channel to talk about star wars now let's do it i'm gonna do it right now <laughs> on that <Okay>. note <laughs> there we go <laughs> have a good week everyone <laughs>